Hey friends, welcome back. My name is Annie Elise and this is Tend to Life. I'm sure most of you guys already know what we do here, but just in case you don't, this is the place where we come and we like hang out on my comfy couch and we talk true crime and I kind of just like lay it out for you as though it's a conversation that two friends are having. I like to keep it casual. I like to throw in some opinions, the red flags, things like that, and just kind of have like a dialogue, some good convo going. And so if you've been on this channel before, you get it, you know the drill. And thanks again for tuning in today and supporting the channel. But if you're brand new and you have never checked it out before, welcome. We are now new friends, so hello new friend. Um, I hope you appreciate today's case coverage. And if you do, make sure that you subscribe so that you could be an official 10 to life member, not member, but you know, like part of the crew, like all of us who hang together on the live streams and all that, it's free. I'm not trying to ask you to be a member, I'm just saying subscribe if you like it. God, that really didn't come out right, but you get what I'm saying. Um, Anyways, let me just keep going. And today we're talking about a case that is one that we finally are getting updates in that so many of us have been following and so many of you have been requesting that I cover. And it's the case of Michael Vaughn and all of the new crazy updates that are coming out minute by minute and a full overview for some of you who may not be as familiar to the case or are just, you know, wanting to have a little bit of a refresher. So guys, let's jump right in. Tend to life with Annie Elise starts right now. When you come from a small community, it can be easy to get comfortable and assume that you and your family are safe at all times. That is until the unimaginable happens. When this occurs, everybody wants to know where does the blame lie? Who was responsible? Why did nobody step in? Or is it actually possible to vanish without a trace? The simple answer may even lie much closer to home than initially suspected. Michael Vaughn is a happy and vivacious child. He's five years old and has bright blonde hair, baby blue eyes with a fair complexion. Michael is affectionately called monkey as a term of endearment by his family. He was born on June 24th, 2016 to his mother, Brandy Neal, and his father, Tyler Vaughn, in Fruitland, a small town near the border of Washington. Brandy Neal and Tyler Vaughn have a pretty solid relationship. It doesn't look like they're married, however, they raise several children together, and at least two are from both parents. It looks like Brandy has been married a few times in the past and may have other children from a previous marriage. As for Tyler, Not too much relevant information is known about him, other than his father, Bob, who lives with both him and Brandy in their small home on Southwest 9th Street in Fruitland. A little over a month after Michael's fifth birthday, Brandy and Tyler would experience the worst nightmare two parents could possibly endure. Their entire world would flip completely upside down. On the evening of July 27th, 2021, Michael was at home with his father, Tyler, while Brandy was at work. At around 6.30 p.m., Michael was seen playing with his Nintendo Switch when Tyler had left to wake up to Michael's little sister. Tyler later recalled that he changed his daughter's diaper and called a pizza place nearby to order food for dinner. Right after, at about 6.40 p.m., Tyler realized that Michael wasn't inside. He went outside to check on him and thought that maybe he missed Michael when he went outside. So Tyler scoured his house in hopes that Michael had maybe run inside without him realizing, had gone outside, back inside. He cleared the home. And once he cleared the home, Tyler panicked and called Brandy to tell her that Michael was missing. Brandy raced home and her and Tyler drove to the splash pad, a popular spot for young kids and their parents, thinking maybe he was there. After that, they drove throughout all eight streets of the neighborhood with no luck in finding Michael. Their beloved monkey had inexplicably vanished without a trace. Almost an hour after Michael was last seen, at 7.20 p.m., the police were finally called. Now, I know what you're thinking. That's a long time to not know where your five-year-old son is. For most of us, when we turn around and expect to see our child be right there and they aren't, I think it's safe to say that it feels like your soul has left your body, so I can't imagine that feeling for 50 minutes before calling the police. But let's just hang tight for a second here. So there are many things that could have gone differently that night. For one, Tyler never should have let his son out of his sight for as long as he did. 
Although unfortunately, that's something that Tyler will have to live with for the rest of his life. I don't fault Tyler for going 10 minutes without seeing Michael before he realized that his little boy was missing. That is scary, but when you think he's in the house and very close by, I can see why you wouldn't immediately assume the worst. It happens. So what I do fault both parents for, however, is the fact that they waited close to an hour after he went missing to call the police. I can sort of understand thinking that maybe he was just wandering around the neighborhood, but that in itself is horrifying. And in the worst case scenario, you call the police right away and take up a bit of their time and then hopefully have your son home safe. The alternative that they chose didn't help anyone, especially Michael. When Payette County police arrived on the scene, they scoured everywhere near Michael's home on Southwest 9th Street. They searched all night and into the next morning. They sent out the first missing and endangered child alert at 8.20 p.m. that night, followed by four different alerts to emails, phone calls, and text messages all the way up until 11.21 p.m. late that night. Michael was last seen in his light blue Minecraft t-shirt, dark blue boxer briefs, and a child size 11 dark sandals. He was approximately 3 feet 7 inches tall and weighed 50 pounds at the time that he wandered off. Now, on the early morning of July 28th, the Idaho State Police and the FBI became involved. The police department for the Fruitland area is very small and only has about 12 officers working the beat at any given time. It's pretty safe to say that Payette County Police Department doesn't deal with missing children very often, if ever, and they were more than happy for any extra help or outside resources that would come in and assist. A few days after Michael's disappearance, on July 31st, Chief Huff with the Payette County Police gave a press conference to explain the investigation. They had talked to every neighbor in a close proximity to Michael's home. They also looked through as many surveillance and doorbell cameras as they could. By doing so, they were able to find a few joggers and people walking, as well as cars in the area, that were of interest to them and to the investigation. They made it clear that they didn't know who the owners were of two of the vehicles that were around at the time of Michael's disappearance. One vehicle was a blue Dodge Avenger, and the other was a white 2017-2018 to Honda Pilot. They were also looking for information on a jogger, and a man walking in the area of that splash pad at the time that Michael disappeared. This, okay. Um, Today, the Fruitland Police Department, in conjunction with the state police, multiple Treasure Valley law enforcement agencies, and the Federal Bureau of Investigation, we continue to search for missing and endangered five-year-old Michael Joseph Vaughn, MJ to his family and friends. Michael was last seen near his residence on Southwest 9th Street in Fruitland, at approximately 6.30 p.m. on July 27th, uh, 2021. Operations to date include the methodical search of the area near Michael's residence, which included two irrigation runoff ditches, which were drained by the Fruitland Public Works Department in an extensive uh, search and rescue effort, including the use of canines, aerial, and marine and land support. Idaho Fish and Game officers are continuing to search the river by boat for four to five miles down river and back up and in the sloughs of the Snake River as well. The Fruitland Police Department will continue to organize search and rescue operations with resources provided by the Idaho Mountain Search and Rescue Team, the Fruitland Fire Department, and the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and others. We've received a tremendous amount of support from the Fruitland community and we'll continue to call upon them, but as needed. We're continuing to seek the public's assistance to identify individuals who are in the area of Southwest 8th, Southwest 9th, and Cornwall Way in Fruitland from 6.30 and 7.15 p.m. on Tuesday, July 27, 2021. If you were in that area or you know someone who was, please contact us at 208 642 6006 extension zero. That's the Payette County Sheriff's Office and again a tip line. Even if you don't believe that you have something that's relevant or relevant information to this case, we want you to contact us so we can recreate a complete picture of the time that Michael was last seen. Every minute counts in these investigations when searching for a missing child and we appreciate the public's support and cooperation as we continue the search for Michael. If you live in the immediate area, please thoroughly search your property. 
to include any outbuildings, vehicles, anything that a five-year-old kid could get into. Uh, we also ask that you review any security camera footage that you may have that may be attached to your house. Uh, video is extremely important to us in these, in these circumstances and these investigations. We're also very grateful for the public's assistance in following up on each lead. We are following up, vigorously following up on each lead that we're getting in. So I want to make it clear that as your tips are coming in, they're not falling on deaf ears. The community knows because they see us out here every single day, pounding the pavement, pounding these rural areas. We are, we are working. We're committed to finding Michael and we're not going to leave any stones unturned. So you need to understand that the investigation of this child is a, we're using every resource and it's very intense. We ask that the community only report information from credible sources to law enforcement. And as we know that as we're just, um, we know that if we're just coming up with speculation, it causes rumors and we'd like to have factual information. So please help us out that way so we can chase down factual leads. We also want to emphasize that Michael's family continues to be 100% cooperative with our investigation and we're asking you to be extremely respectful of their privacy during this situation um, and we would appreciate that. Super difficult time as you would know. So Michael was last seen wearing a light blue Minecraft t-shirt over here on my left, uh, dark blue boxer briefs, a child size 11 sandal um, and he stands three foot seven inches tall, he's 50 50 pounds, he's got blonde hair, blue eyes, and he answers to the nickname Monkey. If you see Michael, have any information that would lead us uh, to his whereabouts or his location, please call the Payette County Sheriff's Office at 208-642-6006, extension zero. So we just want to extend our appreciation to our community. We, we thank you for your continued support and the media. Police used tracking dogs to pick up Michael's scent. The dogs tracked his scent a small ways up the street and stopped short at South Arizona Avenue and Southwest 8th Street. From there, dogs lost him, which is a major concern. I'm unsure if the parents were told what that likely indicates, but from an investigative standpoint, if a scent stops dead at an intersection or at a road, it can often mean that the missing person was likely picked up there. However, it is true that tracking dogs and other canine units are only as good as their handlers. But by having help from the FBI and other outside resources, it's likely they probably have the best canine units available. It was said that canine units from coast to coast were brought in to help with the investigation. According to Chief Huff with the Piatt County Police Department, he said, Our canines have searched a one to two mile radius near where Michael went missing. We have searched nearly every property on Southwest 9th Street, including front and backyards. The search for Michael will not stop until he's found, and the search remains very active. As I've said to the public, the effort may look a little bit different from time to time, but those of us in law enforcement leading the search and the investigation, Michael's on the top of our mind. He's our top priority, and finding him is an intense daily part of our lives. Michael Joseph Vaughn was last seen near his residence on Southwest 9th Street at approximately 6.30 p.m. Tuesday, July 27th, 2021. The first missing and endangered child alert went out at 8.20 p.m. with four different alerts to email, phone calls, text messages being issued to the area residents until 11.20 p.m. that night. Michael's image and information went out to law enforcement nationwide and a database called the National Center for um, Crime, or the National Crime Information Center. And Michael has also been entered in the state of Idaho missing person clearinghouse. From the time of notification, an exhaustive search effort and criminal investigation began simultaneously. So our ground searches are based on the highest probability that Michael may have wandered off, potentially gotten hurt, stuck in an irrigation ditch, a swimming pool, uh, an outbuilding, an old appliance, a junk vehicle, anywhere a 50 pound curious boy uh, could hide himself. We wanted to make sure that all the ground within a one to two mile radius from Southwest 9th Street where, where Michael lives has been searched by residential homeowners, professional searchers, law enforcement, and specifically trained canines. 
and not just one of these groups, but by all of these groups. As such, we've been conducting these searches continuously, even up to this week. On Monday of this week, the Idaho Mountain Search and Rescue with specialty canines and the Fruitland Police Department conducted searches in the front and backyards of nearly all the homes on Southwest 9th Street, as well as another large acreage off of Northwest 1st Street in between Nevada and, and, and Highway 95. On Tuesday, the Idaho Mountain Search and Rescue with their specialty canines, with the Fruitland Police Department, the Idaho State Police, who had a drone in the air, and the FBI, we methodically searched the farm ground to the southeast and southwest of Southwest 9th Street. And combined, we, we, we searched close to 1,000 acres this week. Why would we continue to search areas that have been searched multiple times before? Well, because we haven't found Michael yet, and conditions change. So further, you can imagine going home every night as a law enforcement officer wondering, you know, did we miss something during that search? Michael, Brandy, and Tyler and the community continues to count on us to keep up the search, and that is why we continue to search. And I've said from the beginning that as long as those resources are available, we will continue to ask for them. Remember that a criminal investigation, that happened at the same time a notification as the time that Michael went missing. And due to the fact that we've conducted multiple searches using every tool available to us with no success, it increases the possibility that Michael was abducted. From the beginning until, I guess, until we find Michael, we're considering every possibility and following up on every lead developed, every tip that comes in, and the total number of tips that we've received to date is over 557. And the majority of those tips have been cleared by investigation. The others are currently being worked on. Word of our search has gone worldwide and tips on where he might be have come in from literally around the globe. Thanks to resources available to us again, every tip, regardless of how many miles away, is going to be followed up on. We're committed and we work together to support each other. Every day we come to work, we work through the exhaustion. Um, it, for investigators, there's always highs and lows. Each day we go through these highs and lows. And I can't tell, but what I can tell you is, I can tell you with certainty that the Fruitland Police Department and our law enforcement partners are using every resource available and we'll continue to look into every possibility until we know exactly what happened. We're steadfast in our commitment to bringing Michael home safely. I want to thank each and every search member, the search teams that have been out here, and each and every investigator for their time and expertise and the commitment they've put into helping us bring Michael home. We also want to emphasize Michael's family who continues to be fully cooperative working closely with us on, on almost a daily basis. We ask the community to continue to respect their privacy. As for the reward for Michael, um, the reward for Michael's safe return remains in effect uh, and it's increased. The amount uh, has increased to $50,100. And that's for anyone having information to the, uh, leading to the safe return of Michael and that'll be available until March 31st, 2022. I should also note that Michael's family has made considerable contributions to this reward fund, as have members of the, of the community. And every donation that we've, we've, we've pulled in has been uh, appreciated. I'm gonna continue to update our Facebook page periodically during the course of this investigation. I'll continue to do so if we have some significant developments and our efforts to keep, to keep the community uh, informed as the best we can. And so with that, at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Michael's mother, Brandy. Brandy is representing the, Braun, the Vaughn family today, and she would like to um, give a statement. So, Brandy. Hello, everyone. I want to thank you for all being here today. My name is Brandy Neal, and I am Michael Joseph Vaughn's mama. I am here before all of you today on behalf of my family to speak about Michael. As much and everyone in our family wants to be up here in front of all of you today, I am here to speak on all of our behalf. I am here to ask you all, I'm here to ask you please, please for your help. 
I am here to ask you to please keep Michael's face, his name, and his story in every one of your hearts, your eyes, and your minds. It has been 115 days, 115 days, he has not been home. And we need every one of you. I need you. I need your help to bring my baby home. Since Michael was only five at the time of his disappearance, there's only so many possibilities of what could have happened. Either he wandered off, was hurt in the home that he was living in with Brandy, Tyler, and Robert, or he was abducted. So the first thing police did was search a one to two mile radius around the area that Michael went missing, as I mentioned. They also cleared the family as there was no evidence of foul play on their property. However, that hasn't stopped media and public scrutiny of the parents, leaving the only other option there on the table being an abduction. A lot of people found Tyler to be negligent and Brandy to be insincere and theatrical. Look, I understand why people jump to that conclusion, but when the family stands by the Piatt County Police, ISP, and the FBI during every single press conference, it's safe to say they're cleared or certainly are still being looked into. I mean, they're not trying to evade the investigation in any sort. Not to mention, police have happily said that they are always cooperating with the investigation and have always made it a point to tell the press and the public to respect their privacy. So I just don't understand how people can be so callous and jump to conclusions about people that they know nothing about, who are grieving and in the worst kind of pain imaginable with missing a child when police are saying that they're cooperating. It also bothers me to hear rumors of a police cover-up, which is also something that's been circling the internet, especially when other departments who have no loyalty to such a small Idaho County department are joining the investigation to help. When police cover-ups have been, which is very rare, by the way, although not impossible, it's usually within the local department, not statewide or even federally. So I just truly wish people could find better use of their times than putting these unfounded claims on this grieving family. There's resources. They're being vetted. Come on. It's okay to speculate. I know I do. I'm not trying to be holier than thou here. But to go out of your way based on rumors and zero facts, it's just not helpful when there's nothing that indicates even the slightest built that the even the slightest bit that there is something shady going on here. I think one of the major things, though, that has put speculation on the family, specifically Tyler, is how quiet he has been to the media. Brandy is the spokesperson for the family, and I can imagine Tyler feels very guilty that his son went missing on his watch. That's a horrible personal demon that should be dealt with alone, not publicly. It's also speculated that Tyler went much longer than 10 minutes not seeing Michael, which is fair, but you have to remember, police have access to surveillance cameras throughout the neighborhood, as well as those eyewitness accounts, so they have a pretty good indication of when Michael went missing. Also in favor of what Tyler has said in the past, police were able to narrow down the timeline of when Michael likely disappeared. Originally, police had said that Michael disappeared between 6.30 p.m. and 7 p.m., going off the last time that his father saw him that night. It's now believed that he disappeared between 6.40 p.m. and 7 p.m. Tyler was later able to provide a receipt from the pizza that he had ordered, and the timestamp was 6.40 p.m. It's unclear why they changed it, but it's safe to say and assume that they have corroborating evidence indicative of where Michael was last seen by neighbors. Tyler, can you walk us through just that night? Um, I know you were home with the kids. Can you just walk us through everything that happened uh, last July? Went back to change bug. Um, Michael was playing on his switch. Um, she was sleeping, so it took a minute for me to rouse her. And then I changed a diaper and ordered pizza. Probably took me, I don't know, 15 minutes maybe. And came back out and went outside to smoke and Monkey wasn't outside, so I figured he was inside with his brother, wasn't inside, and then I started to freak out and it's all kind of a kind of a blur from, from there, just running all over the neighborhood and I got me 
I ordered the pizza at 6.40. I really don't, couldn't tell you any other timestamp behind besides that with 100% certainty. And I don't even know if that's when I entered the order or when I finished the order or or what. I The receipt said 6.40. And were you in the house when you ordered or were you outside? No, I was in, in the back bedroom with Bug. Following, I mean, when you realized that you didn't know where Michael was, I mean, what did you do then? Did you knock on neighbors' doors? Did you? I, I came outside and I looked down the street and I hopped in the car and called Brandy and drove to the splash pad and and then all over the neighborhood, walking, running, driving. Like I, I couldn't tell you where. I mean, I I didn't leave the neighborhood. But all, all up and down this, you know, Eighth Street complex, I, I was. We were both all over. Um, some of the people that like to speculate uh, are wondering, well, you know, why did you call Brandy? Why didn't you just call the police first? I mean, what was your rush? What was your thought going in? into that. I mean, obviously it probably wasn't rational because you were anxious. Um, but I mean, can you just explain a little bit about your process in that way? I was scared and she was the first person I thought to call. I, I needed her home as fast as I could because I was panicked and out of my mind. Going off of that question, I just think, just I'm sure you guys see a lot of the stuff online as well. I mean, last person to see is people speculate about that. What would you say, just to people, to help clear your name a little bit? Yeah. The, I mean, anybody that's looked into the timeline, I feel like, it, I mean, I. There was no time for me to do anything. Not to mention I didn't leave the neighborhood besides in a cop car for two or three weeks. Okay. I mean, I, there was thousands of people everywhere. I mean, I, there's nothing that I could have done. I mean, I, I don't know how some people don't see that, but. Talk to me about your relationship with Michael. Yeah. What? Was he like to you? Is. Yeah. Sir, <laughs> is. What, is. what is he like to you? He's my best little buddy. He's... We do, you know, comic books, monster trucks. He's the sweetest little boy in the world. He was always trying to help. Oh. He's perfect with his sister. They have an amazing relationship. Both his sisters. Both his sisters. <laughs> <laughs> he's just, he's a wonderful, wonderful little boy. And he, he doesn't deserve this. So for the first year, things were quiet. There was no sign of Michael. There were no new leads. There was, of course, internet speculation. But that was it and police gave another press conference at the one-year mark of Michael's disappearance. Chief Huff facilitated, and Brandy spoke about Michael. The investigators put Michael's face in a national information database for missing children. Chief Huff made it clear that the longer the search goes on, the bigger the chances that Michael was abducted. Huff tells the public that they continue to receive and clear leads. They needed as much help as possible to bring Michael home. Chief Huff reminded the public about the two cars seen in the area at the time. The blue Dodge was cleared. 
However, he told the public to remain vigilant and to keep their eyes peeled for the same 2017 to 2018 Honda Pilot that was seen driving in the neighborhood the night Michael disappeared. They believe that the car belongs to a resident. They were able to identify and clear that jogger who was seen that night, but they also still needed to find out who that man walking near the splash pad in Crestview Park was. He clarified that neither the owner of the Honda nor the man seen walking were in trouble, but that they wanted to get in contact with them in case they had witnessed anything. The man walking was described as a white male in his late 20s to early 30s, wearing a sleeveless t-shirt and black shorts and a hat. The fact that out of four sightings in such a small area, only two were cleared is very worrisome to me. I would be so concerned that in such a small town and neighborhood, there were at least two unidentified people at this point wandering around that nobody could identify up to a year later. Michael's image and information went out to law enforcement nationwide on a database called the National Crime Information Center or NCIC. Um, and Michael's also been entered into the state of Idaho Missing Person Clearinghouse and the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. The Fruitland Police, Payette Police, and Payette County deputies and citizens searched through the night until support arrived the following morning. The ensuing response was immense. We had over 100 law enforcement officers from federal, state, and local agencies, including the FBI Child Abduction Rapid Deployment Team, along with trained search teams, converge on our small city of Fruitland. Our physical search efforts were conducted by experts from the Idaho Fish and Game, the Idaho Mountain Search and Rescue, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, both Fruitland and Sand Hollow Fire Departments, multiple law enforcement agencies, and coordinated citizen searchers. The search included over 200 residential homes, properties including outbuildings, a septic tank, garbage cans, vehicles, irrigation ditches, and drain canals. Trained search teams and law enforcement along with specialized canine teams from across the country searched over 3,000 acres of farm ground along with areas surrounding the city and out into the county. Sophisticated drones, boats with sonar, uh, boats with canines, kayaks, paragliders, I would say that if we could have dammed the Snake River, we would have. With the help of residences and businesses, uh, we were able to retrieve hours and hours of security camera video and we continue to reference that video while working on our leads. So let's talk about since the disappearance of Michael. When I tell you our investigation has been intense and daily, I can assure you that it has been. Uh, since the, the disappearance, detectives and, and investigators across the country have logged tens of thousands of man hours to bring this case to conclusion. We've gathered an immense amount of data and continue to work through it with experts from several agencies. We've applied for and served over 27 search warrants, uh, but that may seem low, but I'm telling you that we've also performed, uh, you know, probably triple that in mutual consent type searches. So the search warrant and consent searches we've, we've performed have yielded uh, high volumes of data and search warrants are still being written today. The data requires expertise from law enforcement partners and this takes a lot of time to decipher. We continue to use all of our investigative resources to include that of the Idaho State Police and our friends at the FBI. Further, the Idaho State Police and the FBI have assigned investigators to work specifically with the City of Fruitland Police Department on this case, and our partnership is healthy and strong. We continue to call upon the Idaho Mountain Search and Rescue teams uh, with their specialized canine units, and we've received some recent leads that have put us out in the area again, um, searching more acreage and I can't thank them enough for, for what they've done for us. Uh, on a moment's notice, they're jumping and running for us. Although unsuccessful with these, with these searches, we can't stop and we appreciate the continued support from all of our members and uh, I would tell you that the number of acres searched will continue to grow. So in our efforts to develop a detailed timeline of events leading up to Michael's appearance, we've processed over 1,000 leads. So we've cleared many of these leads, but not all have been cleared because some require assistance from out of state, uh, more investigators, and, and 
and, and probably more importantly, just time to work these things through to make sure we can bring each, each lead to a conclusion. This process is exhaustive and it takes a lot of time and we believe someone out there will ultimately, ultimately provide us with some information that will help us solve this case. It's important to note that as we continue to refine our timeline, um, we now believe that Michael disappeared in a smaller window of time, and that's probably between the air, uh, time of 6.40 p.m. and 7 o'clock p.m. on the 27th. Earlier in the investigation, uh, we needed assistance in identifying two vehicles and two pedestrians that were seen in the area around the time of Michael's disappearance. And so I, you guys need to know that we positively identified the, the blue Dodge Avenger we were looking for and the man that we, see, that we saw jogging in that area. Those, those have both been identified, vetted and investigated and um, to an end. So the white Honda Pilot, 2016 to 18 Honda Pilot that we have leaving the area at approximately that time, um, you know, again, we believe that it belongs to a resident, but we haven't quite been able to, to clear that and verify that. Um, so that's kind of still an outstanding for us. Uh, the man seen walking through the area of the splash pad of Crestview Park leading up to the time of Michael's disappearance, he's not come forward and he has not been identified. So the man's described as a white male adult, late 20s, early 30s. He was seen wearing black shorts, a white t-shirt with cut off sleeves, dark colored shoes and a hat. So I need to make it perfectly clear that he is not a suspect, but we need to talk to him so we can determine his whereabouts and see if he witnessed anything that would be helpful uh, in this investigation. So I plan on releasing a photograph of that individual in my Facebook official posting later today. So you'll all have that. You need to understand that this is a multifaceted investigation. So many leads are working, we're working many leads at the same time. So some leads are temporarily abandoned as priority leads come in, and that's happened to us on multiple occasions. Once abandoned and we, and we clear the priority leads, then we pick those things right back up and we're working on them again until we can work them to conclusion, right? It takes an intense effort and a lot of work to document all of the leads as they're coming in and at the conclusion of this investigation, I'm hopeful, we'll find the, and I'm hopeful we'll find the answers. It's important that our case is organized and very strong. Now this week has been one of the best and worst weeks in the investigation of Michael's disappearance. Finally, on November 12th, 2022, late last week, we had a break in the case. After almost a year and a half since Michael Vaughn disappeared, Chief Huff with the County Police Department told the press on Saturday that there was a credible lead in the case of this missing boy. One of 28 search warrants from the entire case was being served to a couple who rented a property less than a four minute walk away from Michael's home. The couple does not own the property that is being searched and has no known connection to the Vaughns. The couple renting the property that's being searched is Stacy and Sarah Wandra. They are having their yard ripped apart with a backhoe and large machinery as we speak. As I'm sure you can imagine, they are looking for human remains at this point, and they are digging up to three to four feet deep. The police department is doing an intensive excavation on the suspected property. We also continue to follow breaking news in Fruitland. Fruitland police are searching a home in connection to the disappearance of Michael Vaughn. Here's a map of the area we're talking about. You can see the home police are searching in proximity to where Michael's home is. Our crews on the scene say it's only about four minutes away. Our Abby Davis has been there throughout the day today, and she is live on the scene to update us with the latest information. Abby. Doug, law enforcement have been out here since Friday after they received a very credible tip. That is what the police department told us, suggesting that there that Michael Vaughn's possible human remains are in um, this nearby neighborhood, specifically this backyard over here. You can see, let's take a little bit of a walk. The road has been closed to through traffic since Friday evening. You can come over here. You can see this crime scene tape and then continuing walking you can see there is a um, they're excavating the entire yard we are told about three to four inches you can see that dump truck there they have been taking piles of dirt out since about 11 a.m this morning 
where they're taking it. They said they're taking it to an off-site location where it will be processed. Now, like I said before, police obtained a search warrant and began working Friday night. They are they have plans to dig three to four feet deep. Um, you can see a um, a backhoe just went in and it's being used to dig up the top soil. Now Huff said in no way that they believe what they are doing now will contaminate any sort of evidence that they find if they do find any. Now crews involved in the search include Idaho State Police, Fruitland Police, Police Idaho Mountain Search and Rescue, Fruitland Public Works, and the Fruitland Fire Department. Two canine do dogs, canine dogs, excuse me, were also here earlier this morning. They have since left, but they, but crews are telling me that they are very hopeful and that they are grateful for all of the community support. We just have to continue to process this, and if it if it yields, it yields. Um, you know, I guess it's kind of a double-edged sword, do I hope? Um, not really. Uh, you know, I hope that Michael is still alive and that we can bring him home safely to his family. Uh, but we also know that we need to find resolution to this case and, um, you know, we need to just follow the leads and follow the credible information and that's what we'll continue to do. Crews have been out here since about 10 a.m. this morning, and they did take a brief break around lunchtime. There were some possible safety concerns for the crews um, regarding utility lines and such, but you can see now they have since resumed. Now, a family spokesperson said the family thanks the community for all of their supports, but that they're requesting privacy at this time. Now, as far as a timeline, we don't really have one. Crews are expected to work until it gets dark tonight, um, but the police chief did say that they will most likely be out here tomorrow. Um, continuing to work, Doug. Police have roped off up to four houses surrounding the Wandra's home. Their plan is to dig up three to four feet of dirt and load it into a truck where it will then be transported to another location and sifted through. They have arrested Sarah Wandra, the only person so far in this entire investigation to be arrested in connection to Michael's disappearance. Police charged Sarah with failure to report a death, who I think we can all assume is Michael Vaughn. Sarah alleges no wrongdoing. The judge on the case has sealed the court records and other affidavits to protect the integrity of the case. It's been alleged that police don't believe Sarah was the only person with the knowledge of what happened to Michael. And I think we can all assume that Stacy might be the other party involved here. However, we haven't heard any information on Stacy yet. I think if Sarah is being charged with failure to report a death, Maybe she was involved in the cover-up and not the crime itself, but to be determined. Sarah will be in court again on November 21st and again on November 22nd for her preliminary hearing. It's been alleged that the Wandras had a white Lexus that they sold right after Michael's disappearance, which if true, leads me to believe that maybe this was an accident and they he was walking and they hit him and they tried to cover it up possibly, or maybe a crime took place in that car and they had to sell it to get rid of evidence and tried to cover all of this up. The fact that Sarah hasn't received any charges that we know of yet for tampering with the body is a little bit odd to me, and I just can't imagine what Michael's family is going through right now. Brandy Neal told a reporter that she wasn't doing well at all, which I completely get. She also said it was taking everything in her power not to walk over to the Wanderer's home. Police told Brandy to stay away because they were looking for human remains, to which she broke down and said she wasn't ready to come to terms with that yet. She's still been referring to Michael in present tense because she just isn't ready to accept that he might be dead. Fruitland woman Sarah Wandra was arraigned virtually here at the Payette County Courthouse, accused of failing to report the death of Michael Levon for the purpose of concealing the manner in which he died. I understand what they've said is not correct. Sarah Wandra alleges no wrongdoing, arrested for failing to report the death of missing Fruitland boy Michael Monkey Vaughn. Wandra lives at the home where investigators have been digging up the backyard, searching for Vaughn's remains since Saturday, and is now being held on a $500,000 bond. The state initially asking for more. She's a danger to the community, um, and she fails to abide by the social norms that we all expect. And there are obviously very serious implications in her being aware of his whereabouts this whole time. So um, the state's asking for a $1 million bond. 
Prosecutors also say Wander was already on pretrial release for a previous felony charge related to illegally possessing a firearm as a convicted felon. Should Wander post bond, she'll be required to be fitted with GPS monitoring prior to her release. In court Monday, the judge also ruled to seal all documents in the case, including investigative reports and affidavits where the details could compromise the ongoing investigation or potential future jurors. And police tell us they don't believe that Sarah Wandra is the only person with knowledge of what happened to Michael Vaughn. She'll be in court next on the 21st for a status conference and then again on November 22nd for her preliminary hearing. Are you Sarah Wandra? Ma'am, can you hear me? I need you to move in a little closer to the mic. I'm unable to hear you. No, I'm Stacy Wandra. Okay. Um, you're Stacy Wandra? Um. Yeah, I'm Sarah Wandra, sorry. You're Sarah Wandra, okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Wandra, uh, in this case, which is CR 38221769, you are charged with having violated the law in, in one count. It is alleged that you did on or about the 12th day of November of this year here in the state of Idaho fail to notify the coroner of a death, uh, the death of Michael Vaughn, uh, with the intent to prevent the discovery uh, of the manner of death. That is a felony here in the state of Idaho. Do you understand the allegation that's been made against you? I understand what they've said. It's not correct. All right. One of the, you have a number of rights when you are charged with a crime, and the deputies typically hand out a document that describes those rights in detail. Did you receive a document like that? They're giving me documents right now. All right. So in a criminal case, ma'am, you have the right to remain silent as it relates to the underlying charges. You have the right to require the state to prove the charges beyond a reasonable doubt, the right to cross-examine and confront the evidence the state may put on in an effort to prove its case, the right to testify in your own defense if you wish to, the right to use subpoenas to bring witnesses and evidence to the trial as you may determine to be appropriate, and the right to be represented by an attorney at all stages of these proceedings. Do you understand that you have those rights? I have those rights, but I don't have any to be found good if I'm All right, well, so I'm going to remind you that you have the right to remain silent. I'm not going to say uh, anything to you or ask you any questions that are designed to get you to speak about or encourage you to speak about the underlying events. But I, everyone who uh, gives up that right and does uh, speak about the case or make any statement at all about it, of course those can be used against you, so I'll, I'll remind you of that. Um, I'll be honest, I don't fully understand what happened here, what happened to Michael Vaughn. My only guess at this point is that he was killed that very night he was he disappeared maybe at the intersection of South Arizona and Southwest 8th Street where the canines lost his scent. But also, if it was an auto accident, I would imagine that there would have been some sort of evidence left behind, especially if it was enough to injure him or, you know, kill him. I would imagine that there would be blood left behind, matter, broken taillights, headlights, whatever it might be, and it didn't seem like there was. And if he wasn't killed, then that means this may have been an abduction, and I just truly can't wrap my head around that. I tend to believe that whatever did happen had to have happened right around the time he went missing. And either way, this couple allegedly killed an innocent boy, and even worse, hid the death from his parents. I can't think of a worse torment for Michael's family to go through, especially when you think that he was only a four-minute walk from home this whole time. My heart just breaks for them and i hope i hope he's alive and well don't get me wrong but i sincerely hope that if he's not that whatever happened happened immediately and that he was not kept inside that home for a year or so doing god knows what with god knows who i just pray that something you know peaceful is what happened if that's the direction that this goes and my heart just breaks for his family for the Wanderers to pretend like they cared and also help pass out missing persons posters is just beyond evil to me. It reminds me a lot of this whole like Delphi case too. Like it's just sick. I know Tyler Vaughn momentarily lost track of his child. And honestly, all of us parents have done something like that at some point. But now he's living a parent's worst nightmare. 
I know both parents' backgrounds, and yeah, they may not have always been perfect, but they did love their children and never thought that someone so close to home would destroy their lives and not tell anyone what happened to their son. It's just a very heartbreaking story. I'm glad we're finally getting answers, but it's just sad beyond comprehension. You just truly never know who may be down the street from you, no matter how nice and no matter how small the community is. So as this case is unraveling and new details continue to emerge, what are your thoughts? Am I being too soft on the parents here? Do I have a soft spot because I have a little boy who's, you know, three and a half and close in age to when Michael went missing? What do you think about the Wandras? Do you think that Stacy was involved or somebody else? I have to think that somebody knew and helped her. Glad that we're finally getting answers and getting justice for little Michael. I hope that his parents get the answers that they are so desperately searching for. I hope the correct people are held accountable. And I just hope that by chance of a complete miracle, you know, he either did not suffer or is still alive. And I just, it gives me the chills and I hate this. And I think maybe that's why some of you might say in the comments, I am going too soft on the parents. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I am being biased a little bit because I have a boy my own, of my own. But I'm curious to know what you guys think. Let me know in the comments below. And as this case continues to break, I will jump on here and keep you updated. So make sure if you haven't subscribed yet, hit the subscribe button and turn your notification bell to on so that as soon as I come on with an update in this case, you will get that notification. All right, guys, continue to please think good thoughts, say prayers, and keep well wishes for Michael's family. And hopefully we will get those answers very soon. All right, guys, until the next case, stay safe.